it was quite interesting when I started um, talking to Gemma about this. Oh, how did you get over Next bit. When we were beginning to <coughs> put this program together, <coughs> and she was saying, you know, the skills gap is a big issue. Lots and lots of people she'd be contacting in terms of putting the agenda together were saying, skills gap, skills gap, skills gap. The other thing was actually, we were going to have, but the time, the schedule got kind of adjusted. I was also going to be talking a little bit about the use and how to gain value from location services. Because many, many people are trying to use location services off these natty little gadgets <coughs> to try and get at customers, offers, and so on. And I've been doing some research with my students, my final year students, and they've been just characterizing the levels of accuracy of assisted GPS location of these things. Because most people tend to think they are remarkably accurate. Actually, the true, and we've now developed one of the largest data sets, which kind of suggests that might not be the case. But if you want to talk to me about that one after uh, during the lunch break, great, because we haven't got time to do that now. But that was the, those are the two areas we're going to cover. So the big one for you guys is the skills gap. What I wanted to cover is these three aspects. How big is the problem? I want to look at, particularly, many of you guys who are here possibly, um, or maybe your colleagues and your seniors, who may or may not really understand what big data and big data analytics is capable of doing, and what it is not capable of doing and the limitations. And really I want to lead through to perhaps with your cooperation, your input in the second half, is are there some short courses, one day, two day short courses, which could be built by lots of training organizations or even your own internal organizations to try to get some of these aspects across so that all of us can become what you might call intelligent customers of big data analytics. Now a bit of context. <clears throat> this little survey, the top one, the Institution of Engineering <coughs> Technology, published only in the last couple of days, uh, an interesting skills gap problem that the UK's skills gap is the worst it has been for nine years. It is getting worse. <coughs> Now that was in the context of developing apprenticeship schemes, but it actually applies across an enormously wide range of areas. A year and a half ago, what used to be eSkills UK, now Tech Partners and SAS, published a report in the field of big data analytics, <coughs> suggesting that by 2020, there will be 56,000 jobs open for new applicants in 2020, and it's growing quite rapidly. It's not entirely clear whether that's totally new jobs or the total level of jobs at that point, but if it's, and I'll show you the data in a minute, but it's growing. Now the other thing that was interesting, just before that or in parallel, I think it was McKinsey did a similar sort of survey in the USA where their numbers were 150,000 skilled analytics, uh, data scientists were going to be needed in 2020. But they made a very, very interesting point. That, yeah, that's a skill, guys. That people are going to put into your analytics teams. But there were 10 times as many people already in place doing jobs which re rely on data or will become more and more reliant on data. So that says, in the USA, one and a half million people need upskilling between now and 2020. Use that same factor, and it says we have something like 560,000 people already in place, not in tech skilled areas, not in data science areas, but in ordering management type of areas, who need to be upskilled to understand the strengths, the weaknesses, the capabilities, the incapabilities of this whole analytics field. So that kind of sets a bit of a scene. We're looking in the UK, therefore, at perhaps half a million people who don't really understand, 
but need to understand what analytics can do if we are going to get that value which some case studies, some use cases show is available. In the governance, we had a, a couple of presentations this morning which look at some of the aspects of governance. However, in areas that I think are particularly important that come out of some of my reading and some of my discussions with businessmen and businesswomen around the world, a couple here, ethics. Now, how many of you have heard of um, the target company not in the security breach field? Okay, so this is retail, so let us talk a little bit about what Re um, Target did in 20, uh, 10, 11, 12. <clears throat> Their marketing team knew, beyond peradventure, that females who are pregnant have somewhat plastic pre preferences. And what they wanted to do was to find some way of getting pregnant women to be able to realize just how much, how broad a spectrum of, of uh, products Target actually had. So they set a challenge to their data science team, can you, from the purchasing patterns, loyalty cards and so on, and credit card related data, can you identify women who are pregnant? The data science team rushed off and had a, a, a big exercise acquired lots and lots of data, which I think some may or may not have been legal within the, U in the European environment, but they can do it in the States. And they came up and discovered, yes, they could very, very quickly identify women who were pregnant and which trimester they were in, one, two, or three, and within a gnat's whisker or three, the date of delivery, of the ex uh, expected date of delivery of the child. This was a marvelous success, they felt. The marketing team then went off and started sending out little booklets of vouchers. Admittedly, they weren't so crass as to say only for baby stuff. They also included a random selection of other products, you know, lawnmowers and what have you. And they thought this was fantastic. They called in the press, and you can see Washington, um, which one did it? Couple, Washington Post, I think, and there's a couple of other ones. You can still see the articles written by the press the journalist who went into the data science team and saw this all happening. This was thought to be magical. And then the sky fell in. A very angry man turned up at one of those shops demanding to see the uh, manager waving a book of these vouchers. And the opening gambit was, are you trying to get my daughter pregnant? My 16-year-old daughter pregnant? Sorry, sir. Don't know what this is about. A little bit of bargy bargy, and went away and said he'd try and find out. A week later, when he phoned up the father, um, he said to the guy, oh, I've got something to say, I haven't really been able to find anything out. The father said, oh, <clears throat> I have to apologize. There were things going on in our family, in our household, which I wasn't aware of. The 16-year-old girl hadn't quite got round to telling her parents on this little mishap. <coughs> Access by the press to the analytics team, the data science team, was cut off instantly and everything closed down and they tried to deny it had ever happened, but the trouble is those articles are still out there. Not a cost problem, but a massive hit to their reputation. Not helped by two years later with that huge data breach around Christmas 2014. Two very nasty hits, huge vulnerabilities for reputation for that company. So that raises some interesting questions. Are there questions we should not ask of our data? Or does it say there are things we should not do once we've done the analytics and got some insight? Pose that as a two ends of the ethics spectrum questions. Leads to the question about the actions. You know, should we or should they have sent out those uh, sets of vouchers? A second question relating to understanding of analytics and analytics projects is the fact that most projects, whether IT related or analytics, are not hugely successful. 
We hear in lots of conferences like this the one or two or five or ten projects which were great. They improved turnover by 5%. They improved profit by a few percent or something. They increased the number of customers. They might even have got around to say, actually, the, thing that's, the only thing that's important is it's improved cash flow by such and such, such and such. However, the reality is that most projects are not terribly successful. I was at a conference in an uh, IBM Insight conference last year, and one of the keynote speakers was saying, actually guys, only 40% or thereabouts of big data analytics related projects are actually meeting the business objectives. We've heard about data protection regime. We've heard a little bit about connecting data already today. Another area that's very, very important is ownership of data. Now, there's two versions of that. Ownership of data within an organization. Is it the chief information officer? Is it the business department who's kind of looking after it? Is it the chief data officer or whatever? But then outside that, you then get the question, Actually, much of this data that you're capturing on your loyalty card programs or whatever come from me, come from you. And when we get into things like those uh, insurance black boxes which sit in the back of your car, or the data recording that sits in your car with modern smart cars, chattering back home to Ford or BMW, Mercedes or whoever with your driving patterns and so on, so that they understand how, you, how their cars are driven in reality. Who owns that data? Is it the manufacturer? Is it me? Is it, well, it's my car, but it's my wife driving, or my son driving, or a friend driving. Who owns that data? Very, very interesting questions. And then, of course, we get to this one. Huge amount of hype, as I say, about BDA, big data analytics. What actually can it do and what can't it do? And one of my major bet noirs is one of the greatest of all of the hype subjects is predictive analytics. We've got all this data, and how far into the future can we predict how our business is going to go? Of course, senior execs, with a strategy perspective, are wanting to know what's going to happen quite a long time into the future. But if you go to a SAS and IBM analytics conferences, you suddenly discover that, yes, they're doing their uh, training of the algorithms, the machine learning algorithms, based on the last three months or last six months' worth of data, and using analytics factories, um, which work out which is the best algorithm for doing the predictives. And then they choose the right one, and then they use that for a while. And you think, hey, it's great. And then suddenly, they drop the real bombshell. Ah, well, what we then do, in three months' time, we import the next set of training data and retune all of our predictive um, algorithms. Does that mean the insights you got on the last set of training algorithms is now no longer valid? Have I only got a three-month perspective of, of, of prediction? <coughs> what about that five-year that is important strategically? You have to understand what you're really trying to achieve. Because if you do only need that three-month prediction window, great. But you've got to ask yourselves the right sort of questions. This is not about big data analytics projects. This is about the generic success rates, or otherwise, that have been running based on the um, Standish Group Chaos Report since 1994. The green line is a successful project, on time, to budget. This part was and met all the sign for functionality at the project launch. They've changed the, the um, definition slightly in the last couple of three years to, and was I think it's reasonably successful, or words like that. And as you can see, actually, it reduced the level of success to around about 30% are actually on time to budget and deliver a reasonable amount of business success. This line, the yellow line, 
are those that Standish Group call challenged. They met some of the business objectives. They were so over budget and probably late as well. And as we all know, a challenge project like that that delivers only part of the functionality actually causes the users quite an interesting amount of extra work to kind of cope with the lacking functionality because the world does not cooperate and say, just because you haven't got that transaction, I don't want that task done. So they have to find ways of actually going around the system, and that costs effort. And then this red line are the failed projects. In Spanish group terms, they might have been restarted several times, but they never were implemented. And we're still running at 20% of all IT-related projects are failures. So, failures, challenge, 30% successful. Now, BDA at the moment is about 10% better, apparently. It's 40% delivering most of the business value. So we have to think about that one carefully. I thought it would be useful to show this as the challenges about big data initiatives. First one's interesting. We haven't <coughs> talked about that, I don't think. It, what is the value of our projects? Can we get it? Then today, this topic, skills and capabilities, big issue. And then we've got the one we just had the last talk, risk and governance, and then a whole lot of other ones here. So what do universities do? Well, we are trying to fill in the front end, your, the skills for your um, new recruits out of university. I just want to briefly cover what was happening there. This is the Tech Partners eSkills uh, and SAS report showing how rapidly the technical skills requirements are ramping up. Recruitment is a pro serious problem. Those percentages are the number of jobs that companies are having great difficulty in filling, which indicates just how short we are of graduates with those technical skills that you're desperately needing. And then another interesting thing. Universities and training courses have typically covered the technical stuff. But every year, people like you are complaining to us that you're not developing <coughs> or delivering students or graduates who are actually terribly useful. Yes, they've got the technical bit, but their soft skills, communication, creativity, curiosity, collaboration, communication, aren't really up to um, what we need. And the final one, which I'm now latching onto with Boson at, at the University of Derby, is trying to get our students from almost day one, first year students, to start thinking about storytelling. Got lots of data, I've got lots of pretty pictures, lots of graphs, but how do I convey that in a compelling way to the audience? And so we're beginning to work on that one. And a, a, um, a conference I chair annually with IBM, the Big Data Analytics Educational Conference, you know, we're beginning to move from curricula around that, we're now beginning to move across to how do we get those sort of things into the curriculum for our data scientists, for our big data analytics um, people. So they become valuable. But if I can't tell the story, you won't connect it. Well, you, you won't understand what all those charts mean. Now, if we had looked at the last presentation, just the presentation, the words, without the story that came with it, we wouldn't have gained much from that presentation, probably. So storytelling is hugely important. And so we're beginning to start doing some of this. We're also doing quite a bit on the right-hand side of getting students to learn how to learn, learn how to find out, rather than boringly just teaching the technical stuff there. So that's how we're trying to fill in at the front end. Now. The nub of the matter inside your organizations. <coughs> a 
question to you all folks. Do you feel that all of those around you who are using the product of analytics, do they really understand its capabilities or do they need to have some sort of course, whether you develop it in-house or whether universities and training organizations and so on deliver them for you? Hands up, we think we are, you're okay, we can cope. One or two in big organizations who are really, really, really focused on it. So but how many think something else needs to be done? We, there is a need for some of these very short courses to help develop an understanding, to become intelligent customers of analytics teams. Ah, excellent, about 95%. So what we're going to do now, very, uh, we've got about 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes, is with most of them will take, bring the um, microphone around, and what I'm going to do is then record in the presentation here for publication tomorrow some of the ideas that you would like to feed into this process so that we can start moving forward with meeting your needs. So I want to look at, first of all, the roles and the levels. And by that I'm thinking really, is it the CXOs, the chief, ex um, chief executives, the chief operating officers, chief information officers and so on? Is it the next tier? Um, is it global, the same sort of course for everybody? Or is it for marketing, inventory management and so on, customer management, what have you? And uh, we need to get this sort of input from you as to how you feel this will work best. And then a little bit of an identi identification of at each of those skill role levels, what kind of things are going to be critically important <coughs> for those short courses to deliver? And that ought to almost automatically leads into defining the curriculum. And then we can move away maybe through PECs and other organizations that are doing this sort of work at the conference level, bring in the training organizations, whether it's ATOS or Learning Tree with their new model of short deck courses as well. You know, we can start thinking about who could be your suppliers. You could go to people you already know as training suppliers and say, I want this. And one of the points is, if we've got 560,000 people to be processed in the next three years now, there's enough training business for more training organisations probably than we um, have actually in the UK. So there's a lot of work to be done. If we are going to get really good value for our organisations and minimise our reputational risk among other things and minimise the wasted effort on unsuccessful projects. Just as a thought on just how costly those unsuccessful efforts are. There's a range of estimates of the cost of those challenged and failed projects that ranges worldwide between something like <coughs> at the bottom end to th three or four hundred billion dollars a year wasted effort on to one extreme at six trillion dollars which is twice what the world spends on IT projects and activities every year. We spend three trillion dollars a year, which is five percent of world GDP. And we can see from those numbers, okay, big big band from five three to five hundred million to three to six trillion dollars. But whichever end is is true, or where it is in the middle, the world is wasting a staggering amount of shareholder value on unsuccessful and challenged. IT, big data, and such like projects. And we in here don't want to be part of that, those organizations who lose or waste shareholder value. So there's lots of things we need to be thinking about. So what I want to get out of today in the next 10 minutes is some ideas that will help us with that, folks. So over to you, and most of them will capture 
you with the, your input from the microphone for us to share, and then I will try and record it. some of the best ideas here, and then most I will put our heads together later on and flesh out some of the details and put it up on my website, and um, which you can see at the front, um, the link at the front, I'll get that um, up later on. And then you, you can help refine it and develop it. Over to you folks. Who's got some ideas? So, um, I guess I'm not a, an analyst, um, far from it, but from my perspective there are a couple of angles. One of which is you put on 560,000 people who rely on analysts. Um, in my experience of working with analysts and working with sort of client teams who engage with analysts, it's a very sort of linear relationship. I'll ask you to do this task and then you do this task and give you the answer to that very specific. I think there's a role that those half a million people have to play, which is actually what's the context, what's the business requirement, what's the bigger picture, rather than simply, I need this piece of analysis. So there is a kind of an element of contextualising the requirements. Um, I think to your second point around the storytelling, I absolutely agree, you know, data is frankly just numbers, unless there is a so what and a now what from it. Um, but I guess I have a challenge, which is, how do you play to people's strengths? People cannot learn how to storytell in a short course. So therefore, do you play to people's strengths, which is I, you are employed as an analyst, as a data scientist, because you have those specific skills. There is somebody else who has that storytelling ability and kind of elevating it to the sort of the commercials that will engage a CMO or a CEO. Do I detect from what you're saying that you feel that many of your existing colleagues are not particularly brilliant at storytelling? And that's not specific to analysts, no. don't get me wrong. <laughs> you were just confirming something that someone said to me a few weeks ago. Interesting, thank you. Hi, I've um, over the last few years worked in the technical environment, and in those years I've had three undergraduates and place from years working with me or working for me. The biggest gap I've seen in those guys that come through is a prior to really understand what the business wants to do as we just mentioned, but also technical proficiency. They will come in with a good understanding of Java and various languages like that, which is great if we want to get them in the application world. When we want to get them in analytics, they struggle on SQL. They'll understand the basics, accounts, etc. When you start looking at analytic or OLAP functions, rollups, cubes, um, star schemas, anything like that, they haven't got to do. And I spend a lot of time working with those guys in those environments. And the relationship modeling with a nerd base warehouse for a big data environment is a big knowledge gap from what I saw from those three guys I worked with. Okay, thanks. So that's something you would like us to think about as well for our own degree programmes. Possibly croaky. Um, yes, it is. Um, I think when those guys come into the workplace, we can work with them, but those guys were with me for nine months each, and it was only the last two months that it really been properly used to us. Um, they did, they could do with pick up other things, they picked up um, batch routines, that kind of stuff. Mm. But they couldn't drive us forward in moments to go, couldn't use them for that. Okay. We had to rely on our probably guys with 10, 12 years experience of how to make really performant complex, uh, do complex analytics and data. We still had to push that into that group. Okay, thank we you. couldn't use our graduates for that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, but coming back to <coughs> the people who you currently got around you, that you might say the customers or commissioners 
of analytics teams and analytics projects. What other things do we need? You're saying you need, as a customer, you need to understand how to give the broader, bigger picture so that it's not, this is what you asked, here is the code that does what you asked, which is kind of not very helpful. Because you're looking for insights rather than a particular graph, aren't you? I think ultimately. Is that the case? Okay. We should, uh, yeah. We can talk about the uh, new science, uh, the data science program that we have just approved at the university, because that actually gives some sort of insight into the inner working of these two questions. Yes, I mean, we're just launching it, or just got approval for a data science course in parallel to our analytics course. And the data science is that's a more hardcore the coding, the programming, the understanding of how different types of languages like R or SAS or the IBM product set. And yeah, it also includes things like ethics, it includes visualization and storytelling and so on. So we're trying to build both ends of the spectrum of the analytics team because the kind of hallmark of analytics conferences for the last two, three years has been the problem of the unicorn. A fully rounded um, person who does the whole lot from the data loading, cleaning, ETL, all the hardcore math statistics, predictives, and then the visualizations and the storytelling. Well, like unicorns, that one person never exists. So you're looking at teams, and we're trying to look at the whole spectrum. And that's what many universities are now beginning to do. Not very many yet, but we're beginning to get that uh, understanding of the spectrum there's about a dozen or so universities in the UK and quite a lot in the US and other countries who are beginning to build out this broader approach to the different parts of the whole and that data capture, joining, analysis, and presentation, visualization. But so we're trying to address that, but that's only feeding in really into your, you call it the analytics team, the data science team, whichever, whatever you, your business calls it. But what happens when they're there, and now they've got this huge raft of data. They're joining data from everywhere um, that they can get hold of legally, and then with ICO permission and so on, etc., etc., come up with interesting insights. What do we need, or do training organizations need to do to help you and your colleagues really gain maximum value from that big investment in data and in people and in hardware and technology so that you can get the right value creating insights that are going to drive your company forward. That's what we're trying to get at. Yes? Um, yesterday we heard a lot about um, data scientists and I think there was a, a feeling in the audience that a lot of us here are from a business insight background rather than the data scientist yeah. background. And it seems to me that what we're talking about is somehow trying to join you know, the two together because um, at, at the end of the day, a business has a strategy, it's trying to follow and achieve certain goals to, as you say, deliver shareholder value. And if a, the business insight team have got specific insights that they want to try and find out more about, um, there seems to be a gap between them and then the data scientists who, as we heard a lot yesterday, need to do exploration um, to get to where, you know, to find out if there is anything of value there. And it's that gap that we somehow need to try and bridge so that the data scientists are allowed to do what they're good at and explore and hopefully come up with stuff, but if it doesn't deliver insight that's actually of value to the business, and when people can then story tell and, un, you know, and understand, it's, it's useless, and that's why you get this failure of, of so many projects. And so, is this because the data scientists or the technical, as we might call them people, don't really understand the business well enough, or there's a different jargon that they use compared to the jargon well, in a sort of meaning technical understanding or business understanding that you guys have got that is this middle problem. Yeah, 
Because yeah. there's an, another thing that's happening a lot I'm, I'm hearing out in sort of conferences and talking to people is because, and it really mirrors what happened in the 1980s with the development of end user computing, is more and more very large organizations, particularly, are building huge data marts, as they call it, and then allowing people who want to analyze the data to use it. Now, they then need some interesting levels of training to be able to ask the right question. Otherwise, as I discovered during end user computing, you pose a business problem to 10 relatively competent people. The same question, and they would give you 10 different answers. What do we need to do to solve that problem? <laughs> um, I mean, just to, to sort of sum up, I think, yes, there's a huge communication sort of gap, and it comes from both ends, really, because there's no doubt that businesses often are not clear enough strategically where they're going. They're busy, they're trying to, you know, just uh, build, build their sales and get revenue in, and they're not necessarily communicating clearly enough their, their strategy right the way through to those those data scientists. So, yeah, I think communication is a big, big area that um, needs to be matched up. And that goes back, oh, yeah, so. <clears throat> I tend to agree with the lady because uh, uh, it is easy and possible to teach data analytical skills or you can use a tool, but the data interpretation is a big problem. So, so, so you know, the people who analyze data, they can analyze data, you know, let's say they can find correlation between variable A and variable B, but to figure out whether variable A is the leading, is the cause or variable B is the cause, that takes someone who can understand. So, so so, yeah. and, and you know, uh, uh, last year I, we were uh, recruiting people from a leading institute in India, and this was exactly the problem. We gave the, the kids all the data. They played with the data, but when they came out with the, with the conclusions, they were absolutely divorced from the meaning of the data. So, so even though they had the field name, right, they, they, knew, they knew what the data is about, but the conclusions were absolutely statistical without giving any hint of you know, understanding. So, so the correlation rules rather than causation. I mean, there's a fabulous absolutely. one out there of, which correlates with R equals 0.97. So it's almost perfectly linear correlation between the number of tons of lemons, fresh lemons imported into the USA year by year with the number of road deaths in the USA year by year. An absolutely perfect correlation and has obviously no causation. Well. Unless you can come with something interesting. So, but yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so what I believe is that uh, the focus could be a bit more on data understanding and interpretation and not necessarily on analysis. No, and but it, it probably you know, also links to, uh, to you when you have your big data lab. right? Uh, if it is part of your mathematics department or computer department, probably you know it should be more of an interdisciplinary between psychology and you know, our business and maths other than only being focused on maths. So what you're saying is that in many respects, the business domain knowledge is really, really important. Otherwise, you get just dragged down into that correlation game, which is you can correlate almost anything with anything, and it kind of you'll find something. And often the, um, my team has to go and <laughs> think about it. 
and being able to push people to say, well, there's another company that is able to, or I reckon we can join data sources A, B, C, and one might roughly go about doing this in such and such a way, then unlocks a whole load of questions that are just bubbling beneath the surface that business users would ask if they felt they had permission or that ultimately there was a fruitful avenue to explore there. So go and do your research on the internet to find out about your symptoms and then go and talk to them because they can't know everything about everything. That's an interesting idea. So you're looking for brief updates on technological capabilities that will help you as an analytics team or as a, an analytics user or a data mart user. Okay, it's an interesting thought that one. Um, just kind of on that, we, um, I had a, a conversation yesterday um, along the same sort of lines where um, one of the, we were talking about um, some, some data, I uh, said, so well, well, what do you want to know? And so they said, well, we don't, we don't really know what's available. And I think, for, for me, my response was, well, tell me what you'd like to know, and I'll go away and tell you what I can get, what we can't get, and, and if we can't get exactly what it is, then, you know, you, you can get it similar. And I think, from, from that, of knowing, people knowing what's available, I would put it the other way and say, you know, you, you tell people to, you tell people what you want to know, and we'll work out a way of sorting it out.
And that is the nature of the piece that we're dealing with today. Because science is not about just the numbers or the presentations, but both at the same time. And actually, Richard was leading that. Um, he created a course teaching first year students really how to tell stories. So there is a great deal of training that you have to uh, provide to students so that they understand how to tell a story from looking at data and analyzing data. Thank you. OK, thank you. I think we need to draw stumps there, otherwise we'll be running very late. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call the panel.